Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're joining us in the world from, whether it's here in Ottawa in person or anywhere virtually out there. I am Kirsten Eyes, AgaCon Foundation Canada's Director of Public Engagement and Resource Mobilization. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today to an event that AgaCon Foundation Canada is co-hosting with IDRC, our longtime partner and friend. I would like to begin with a territorial acknowledgement. We pay respects to the Algonquin and Anishinaabek Nation, whose unceded ancestral lands we gather on today. We are grateful for the stewardship and courage of elders and traditional knowledge keepers, past, present, and future. We make this acknowledgement to reaffirm our commitment to strengthening relationships, improving our own understanding of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit cultures and peoples across Canada and Turtle Island, critically examining our privilege and moving forward in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. We recognize that since time immemorial, the Algonquin peoples have been coming together at this place where the three rivers meet in a spirit of exchange of goods and services, but also of relations and ideas. And so we seek to continue that centuries old tradition of sharing and exchanging ideas and building relationships. With that, I wanna welcome you all to the delegation of the Ismaili Imamit, which is the representational office in Canada of the seat of the Ismaili Imamit or the institutional headquarters of the Ismaili Imamit in Portugal. Afforded diplomatic courtesies by the Government of Canada, this is a secular facility that is home to the Diplomatic Representative's Office, as well as the headquarters of AgaCon Foundation Canada, which is a registered Canadian charity that works with Canadians and Canadian institutions to eliminate poverty and improve the quality of life on multiple fronts in Africa and Asia. Today, today, together with IDRC, we're hosting an important exchange of ideas regarding complex topics that are affecting our world today. Global health, conflict, COVID, cost of living, and what more needs to be done for resilience in these complexities. So, in order to shed some light on this topic, I am honored to welcome to the stage for a keynote address, Dr. Zulfikar Bhutta, who is the founding director of the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health and the Institute of Global Health and Development with the Aga Khan University, which is part of the broader Aga Khan Development Network. He is also the inaugural Robert Harding Chair in Global Child Health and co-director of SickKids Center for Global Child Health. Dr. Buddha holds adjunct professorships at several schools of public health, including Johns Hopkins University, Harvard, and the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He leads large research groups in Toronto, Karachi, and Nairobi, focused on scaling up evidence-based community interventions and implementing reproductive, maternal, newborn, child, and adolescent health interventions in humanitarian settings. Dr. Buddha is a fellow of the Royal Society, the 2021 IHME Ru Prize recipient for significant research contributions to women and child health, and he was awarded the John Dirks Canada Gardner 2022 Global Health Award, and, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the most prestigious Global Health Awards. I welcome you to the stage, Dr. Buta. <clears throat> Following the keynote address, I will uh, introduce our additional panelists to the stage for an engaging topic on the discussion at hand, and audience members, both in person and online, will have a chance to ask questions. Thank you. So thank you very much for that generous and kind introduction, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Uh, I'm uh, absolutely delighted um, to be at the Imamat after many years. I mean, this is actually our last meeting here was the day everything shut down, way back in March 2020. And I remember standing on the same podium and giving a talk on something comparable on SDGs. So, um, and I hope that we'll never ever see that interruption of the SDGs again. So I've been asked to focus on a complex problem, and it's a complex problem that raises many questions straight away. One of which is, why should a card-carrying pediatrician 
somebody who's worked in global health, particularly global maternal and child health, be interested in the issue of complexity? And, and to answer that question, I will take you through a journey that has been a journey of exploration and still continues in a way to tell you why is this issue now front and foremost on the radar screen of many people working in international development. So let me start by offering you a little bit of what is perhaps a, a confusing issue in global health around complexity because the UN largely defines complexity through the lens of humanitarian crises and emergencies. And much of the definitions that we have in the UN system uh, relate to this being a set of complex crises that are based on social, political uh, issues and contexts that often include volatile, fragile health systems and, and conflict settings. Um, they also recognize that complete humanitarian emergencies of this kind are often where there's complete disruption of services. And therefore, it's not very surprising that in the UN lingo, much of the work on complex emergencies has been clustered around disaster relief or, or crises that happen in conflict settings. And very little attention has been given to what I call complex crises that are more chronic and spread over a period of time, and that become very much part of the landscape. And this is basically what I'm focusing on today is these long-term complex and persistent issues that include many of the four Cs that Kirsten was talking about. And in order to do justice to some of this in the context of current issues and future issues, I think it's important to cast an eye on what the past has been like. And my own journey on understanding some of this has been very much around a process of learning. So I became interested in this issue when UNICEF first asked me, it's close to around 15, 16 years ago, to see if I could evaluate what the impact of the Asian economic crisis had been on child health, maternal health, and nutrition in Asia. And to those of you who may not remember, the Asian economic crisis came out of the blue and came out of basically speculation on the economic market that led to a massive domino effect and devaluation of many currencies in Asia virtually overnight. I actually put the example of Indonesia on this slide because I was in Indonesia when the Asian economic crisis started. And I vividly recall how over a period of four days that I was there, the exchange rate changed on a daily basis. And the hotel that we were staying in became proportionately 10, 15% more expensive every day. So that's how the impact of the economic crisis was. And when I looked at it at that time, it was very clear that different countries in, South, in South, Southeast Asia had been affected differently by the crisis. And there were those who were most affected, and their economies shrank in this one-year period uh, when the economic crisis was maximal 2014 to 15, by as much as 23, 24%. Now, the impact that it had on public health outcomes wasn't apparent very early. Why? Because it only hit the poorest of the poor. And you can see this very clearly in this particular slide, which you look at the impact of the economic crisis on different countries. The red are the countries that were most affected. And this is where you see the impact on things like unemployment rates, on inflation. Uh, you also see the impact on undernutrition. At a time when nutrition was improving through most of Asia, the countries that were affected by the economic crisis most those that are in red here actually saw an increase in overall undernutrition rates and much more remarkably uh, for UNICEF and others, we were able to show how they also experienced, even in that short period of time, an increase in child mortality. So economic crises can have huge impacts that go for a very long period of time and their relationship with outcomes should not be a big surprise to anybody else. My next foray into recognizing some of these relationships also came by chance. When some years ago, 2016, 17 to be exact, I came across this analysis uh, from Stanford by Marshall Burke and Iran bin David, which had looked at Africa and looked at drivers of child mortality in Africa, largely through a time series and geospatial lens 
of demographic and health service. And, and they were able to, first of all, spot very clearly that mortality distribution, even across these countries, was not uniform. That if you look at this map, which looks at the clustering of child mortality, many of these areas with high burden child mortality actually do not respect geographic boundaries. They span administrative zones, and it makes you begin to wonder, are there ecological factors that are influencing child mortality in this, which are more than one country's jurisdiction or another country's jurisdiction? And they also were able to show that if you were to make a difference and focus attention, you would have to do this in a manner that was much more regional and much more ecological than actually country A versus country B in Kharsizwa. But the thing that struck me most was their analysis in terms of specific drivers. So they looked at these um, 28 countries with time trends on child mortality and uh, looked at various drivers over time. And, uh, and basically, they were able to show that three factors were driving child mortality in these countries. And those three factors were conflict, malaria, and local temperature. Now this is at a time, and I remember reading this paper and kind of just reading it three times because I wanted to understand it. But this was one of the first demonstrations at scale, albeit from retrospective data, that these ecological factors mattered, that climate change mattered, that conflict mattered, and that, of course, disease prevention and disease management strategies mattered. Well, what happened after that was I reached out to Marshall and to Iran bin David, become close friends, and uh, we set up a collaboration. And we set up with, again, with IDRC support, the so-called branch consortium to look at this across the entire landscape of maternal child health to say what could be done for women and children's health in conflict settings and emergencies. And it led to the production of several, uh, I think, landmark papers in The Lancet. But one such paper was to look at the burden. How much of a problem was this? And in looking at this in Africa from a child mortality lens, we were able to show that the numbers of children affected directly and indirectly by conflict in Africa in terms of overall mortality numbers was not the 0.5% that IHME would have us believe that over this period of time that we looked at this, there were close to around three to three and a half million deaths that were directly and indirectly attributable to impacts of conflict. What we were also able to show is that there was a gradation of the effect of conflict, that you saw it very close to the epicenter of the conflict, but you saw a ripple effect on the health system as far out as 250 kilometers. So conflict had its own perturbation on fragility and on the functionality of the health system that many people working in those areas knew, but it was not really understood in the global lexicon. The other thing that we were able to show was that some of this effect was long lasting, that the impact on increase in child mortality that you see here and maternal mortality that you see here, these are separate publications, continued for as far out as four or five years after the initiation of the conflict. So the relationship of conflict, fragility, instability, disruption of the health systems, and mortality was established by the branch consortium in quantitative matters. And, and that has been one of the reasons why we have been very interested into seeing how does conflict affect this in, across a vast geography if the guidelines don't refer to what you can do in that setting. So a lot of our work was also around development of guidelines. We were interested in the nexus of conflict, climate, and geography. And, and I have deliberately put down geography of poverty. Why? Because Jeff Sachs wrote a paper on this 25 years ago, highlighting how the poorest areas of the world in Africa, in that middle, were also areas that were disproportionately affected by climate change. So this is our conflict map that we generated. And I want you to, I'll show you some other maps in a minute, but I want you to see the distribution which is largely around South Central Asia and the middle part of Africa. If I was to overlay on this map now, which are the countries of the world which are disproportionately going to be affected by change in environmental temperature or global warming? Not too surprisingly, it is the same middle belt of Africa and parts of South Asia where you see this. 
And now if I overlay on this a map of where the impact on labor or just the ability to function with climate change is going to be maximal, you would not be surprised it's the same geographies of poverty that we're dealing with. So immediately you can see that these are almost the same countries that are dealing with two or three things at the same time. But I can't talk about complexity and crises without talking about outbreaks. And before I turn to COVID-19, you have to remember that COVID-19 struck us in early 2020, but it was not the first outbreak that the world had, had witnessed. In fact, just a few years prior to that, we had had Ebola come up in, East Af in West Africa. And with Ebola, we had also seen how several countries were impacted in a relatively short period of time. These are data for Liberia, but you can see how these were clustered in a relatively narrow period of time. And there was a concerted response, and there were lessons learned from Ebola that were very conveniently forgotten by the time COVID hit. What were those lessons? First lesson from Ebola was it's a complete disruption of the health system. And one of the first components of the health system to be affected were women and children, maternal child health services. The second lesson was that this breakdown hit the poorest of the poor most, that the people who were affected by this disruption were the, were the people who were the most marginalized. And the third lesson was that a lot of the consequences were outside of health. What people conveniently forgot then one of the biggest impacts of Ebola in West Africa was the impact on the education system. When schools were closed for an extended period of time, and extended in that definition was six months, even that six month closure of educational institutions had an impact on education development outcomes that were felt even three to four years later. So come COVID-19, and we had nothing ready was, which was, could be taken off the shelves and implemented in terms of response strategies. So we have stopped counting numbers as of March 10th this year. Uh, that's when the Hopkins dashboard stopped. But uh, amazing that this pandemic killed at least 6.7 million people worldwide. And I say at least because the actual figure is probably two times, if not more. And that although we can claim success at the end of this, the consequences of COVID have been enormous. And I want to share with you in the context of complexity and various issues, how COVID impacted outcomes. So we did this analysis with UNICEF, which we have just published formally of South Asia. We were very interested to look at how COVID impacted women, children, adolescents, and, and, and health outcomes in South Asia. It took us several years to finish this work uh, because it involved a lot of complex data. This just came out in FLOSS Global Public Health. And it involved collecting data from not just the stringent, um, let's say, measures at the earlier stage of the pandemic, but also things that persisted. So although there were curfews and restrictions of movement at the early stage of the pandemic, one of the biggest impacts that happened with the pandemic was on other systems, food systems, economy, education system. So our conceptual framework of what we were trying to look at was broader than health. Health was only a small part of this. We were very interested in looking at what happened to education and education services. And as you can imagine, in South Asia, uh, schools closed very early. I mean, a few countries stopped in early March, but by May, every school in that region and in Asia had closed. But the, but the important thing is not how they closed, but how long did the closures last? And you'd be amazed as to how many countries in South Asia did not reopen their schools right up to the beginning of 2022. Bangladesh was one of the last countries to open its schools, and the consequences of that were enormous. The consequences on health and health system, the disruption in services, these data are not from surveys. These data are from HMIS, from DHIS data, which show you how the reduction in coverage of maternal services, reproductive services persisted right up to quarter three uh, of 2021. But also importantly, that it took a long time for them to recover. But the impact on education is what I want to talk about. And that is that over 400 million children were out of school. 
and a lot of the dropouts that happened in that period of time were in adolescent girls. You can imagine what happens to a 14, 15 year old who drops out of school and stays out of school for two years. And we estimate that there have been probably around four and a half million unwanted early pregnancies in South Asia at that time. And the economic consequences of that are intergenerational because these girls have not only been lost from the education and development sector, they've also become mothers before their time. And the impact on health, sm small for gestational aid births, have all been published and calculated in terms of their consequences. So ladies and gentlemen, the burden of complex crises, how big an issue this is, depends upon what lens are you using? What glasses are you wearing? But just, just very quickly look at these four crises which are the subject of the discussion today. Climate change, conflict, COVID-19 or other pandemics, and cost of living. So I'm going to show you this through several maps. So here's a map of global climate vulnerability. I've just shown you a previous version of this. And you can see that it's largely South Central Asia, Africa, where these climate change vulnerabilities exist. If you look at conflict, you're not too surprised by which countries are affected by conflict as we speak. And, and, and we've added Sudan to this list um, as of the last couple of months. If you look at pandemic propensity and vulnerability, the vulnerability is greatest also in some of these geographies. And you add to this cost of living. And you can do cost of living through the GDP lens, and you can do cost of living through a healthy diet, which is, which limited, which is shown in this slide. And these are also the very countries that are affected by COVID. So we were interested in saying how many countries are affected by these concurrently at the same point in time. And you put it all together and it becomes very clear that the burden of the four crises or complex crises are disproportionate in some of these countries that you see highlighted here. And the importance of recognizing this is that in these very countries it's impossible to plan anything in isolation. Everything is interconnected. So what are the numbers that we are talking about? So I've actually calculated in actual figures from a women and child health lens as to what is the distribution of mortality in these countries with specific high burden risks of complex crises. So these 13 countries that have a crisis score of eight or more have 44% of the total global burden of maternal mortality and about a third of the burden of newborn and child mortality therein. So you're looking at basically a huge proportion of these global population that cannot be addressed by standard business as usual. The thing that I've not shown on this slide, but I can tell in this particular audience, that 11 out of these 13 countries are Muslim majority countries. And that's one of the reasons why we are also very specifically interested in what is the resilience and response structure within this. So let me finish in the last minute or two about saying our aim is to come up with a strategy as to how we can plan and do better given this contextual reality. And to do that, the first step is what I've just told you, is to do the diagnostic around these four complexities and to see these four challenges, and then to filter out from this what are the common impacts of all of this that come irrespective of the complex crisis, economic, disruption, some of the social, cultural, contextual factors, women's empowerment, gender issues, inequality. You can pull those out. And the hope is that through our empiric work, not only do you pull out risks and, and uh, contributing factors, but you're also able to look at potential solutions. And then although solutions may be specific to the various challenges that you see outlined here, we are able hopefully to pull out the common matrix of solutions that can be used for preparedness and planning across these geographies. And I'm extremely grateful to IDRC for helping us support uh, a body of work in several countries that is currently looking at how can this be done within the context of the sustainable development goals. And these specific countries that you see here in green and red are the countries where we are actually exploring at this point in time with support from 
Aga Khan Foundation, Canada, and IDRC, how do you begin to prepare for implementing the health and health-related sustainable development goals? And also in the red countries, how do you implement preparedness given the complexity of the crisis? Thank you very much for your attention. Happy to answer questions in panel. Thank you very much, Dr. Buta, for your view into the challenges facing us in complex environments and perhaps equally illuminating the, defini the definition of a complex environment. Uh, to expand our discussion and viewpoints, I'd like to now welcome our additional panelists to the stage. Choksinga Kurunga is the Executive Director of AMREF Health Africa in Canada. She has over 15 years of experience in the Canadian and international health sectors with an intersectional focus on key populations, women, girls, black, indigenous, and people of color, sexual minorities, and many other populations, including health issues and the social determinants that underpin them. Chuksinga has held various senior level positions over the last decade, including fundraising, programmatic work, and monitoring and evaluation. She's a degree in languages from the University of Toronto, a certificate in communication from McGill University, and a master's in public policy and public administration from Concordia University. Originally from Uganda and having made Canada her home, Chuksinga is proud to bridge the two continents through inspiring and enriching work. Chuksinga is an activist, feminist, human rights defender, and internationalist. Please welcome Chuksinga to the stage. <clears throat> And our third panelist is Dr. Fawad Akbari. As the Director of Humanitarian Innovation at Grand Challenges Canada, Fawad is responsible for the ongoing development and implementation of Creating Hope in Conflict, a humanitarian grand challenge, as well as other potential grand challenges focused on saving and improving lives in conflict-affected areas. He's also responsible for maintaining strategic partnership related to HGC and informing the Canadian and global humanitarian policies and systems. Fawad is a pediatrician, global health and humanitarian response expert with particular focus on health, nutrition, governance, fragility, and intersection across those themes. Prior to joining Grand Challenges Canada, he was the Regional Deputy Director of Programs and Partnerships right here at the Aga Khan Foundation in Canada, and many people in this room were proud to call him a colleague. <clears throat> he oversaw a diverse portfolio of multi-sector programs and partnerships in Canada and the US, including global health, nutrition and humanitarian initiatives, <clears throat> but before this, he also worked at Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan, Cure International Hospital, and Marie Stopes International in different managerial and technical leadership capacities. Please welcome Fawad to the stage. As I mentioned previously, there will be an opportunity for those in the audience to ask questions after our formal questions for the panelists, and our audience doesn't include our online friends. Please forgive us with this technical error and with <laughs> efforts of my gracious former colleague. Thank you. Uh, we'll begin with you, Dr. Buddha Zulfikar. We were previously speaking about the triple threat of COVID-19, conflict, and climate change, which did make SDG number one, zero poverty by 2030, virtually unachievable. Now that the fourth C is in the equation, cost of living, how does this impact the picture and what are your perspectives on what is achievable within the context of the SDGs? So, so first of all, I have to say that there are others who would want another C added or modified, and, and that's corruption. And I think it needs to be said because it's out there in the literature. Um, I think the importance of recognizing the reality of cost of living, or let's say the economic crisis that many of these countries are now seeing post-COVID and certainly post-Ukraine and other conflicts, 
is that almost every solution that uh, has a significant cost associated with it, either diversion of resources from existing resources or from elsewhere, is off the table. And that's why I think the big challenge now in addressing many of the health, climate change, and resilience promoting interventions is to try and see how we can do this uh, without um, hugely expensive ventures, which are going to be unaffordable. But also, it creates the space, Kirsten, for innovation. So my work largely, and my team's work largely, is around seeing what can we do that can be, number one, integrated with existing strategies that we have in place. Are there similarities to what we had to do at the beginning of the MDGs with the maternal child health scenario? where a lot of the reduction in mortality, reduction in inequalities, was because we came out with community outreach strategies and new way of doing things that were just not possible through the traditional health system. So I think the ground reality is that the fourth C is here to stay and that it is impacted both by the other Cs and it itself affects the response to the other Cs. So they're all interconnected. And therefore, the planning process in countries has also got to take that into account. The final thing that I would say is that the big ground reality in all of this is, as we were discussing at IDRC today, is that the planning processes for responding to these, which have been traditionally through the humanitarian lens or through the lens of isolated programs like health or, or you know, education or agriculture, have got to be by necessity become a lot more integrated that we have got to look at new ways of doing things because that's the only way you are going to be able to respond to them. Thank you. Uh, Chuxinga, women and adolescents are particularly burdened by the four Cs that we've been speaking of. As the pressures are particularly intense across vulnerable regions in Africa, what more needs to be done at national government levels? Hmm, thank you for the question, and I think um, Dr. Buta's keynote really touched on that incredibly. So I, I couldn't count how many times he said, and women and children are the most affected, and maternal health is the most affected, and child health is the most affected. So as, we, as I was thinking about you know, how can national governments respond, national governments on the African continent, I thought, well, respond to what? Right? What are we responding to? Are we responding, if we think about conflict, for example, is it responses to an increase in um, sexual assault and sexual violence against women and girls during situations of armed conflict? Is it how do governments or how should governments respond to, um, to drought and famine and other climate-related crises that we're seeing more of and greater severity? Is it providing food in, in those moments? Because that's fine and good and great, but it doesn't get to the heart of the matter, as far as I'm concerned. And it, it's almost like a first aid response to what emerges first when any of these crises hit, right? Um, and it, you know, it reminds me of words that I heard uh, a woman from Kenya years ago talk about the difference between mopping the floor and turning off the tap. Um, and so we have to really think about how do we turn off the tap. We know, we heard already, that women and children are disproportionately affected by the four Cs, by each of the four Cs, by the intersection of the four Cs, and any of the crisis or calamity that happens. Um, and I think we understand that any crisis or calamity that happens um, travels through society through pre-existing fault lines. Uh, it's not new that we constantly talk about women and children, right? So these are pre-existing fault lines um, that we have. And so what do we do? And the key one really is gender equality or lack thereof, right? So I think, so if I go back to your question about what needs to be done, or how do we start to collectively turn off the tap? Because um, this is what governments are here to do. They're meant to safeguard their populations. How do we do that? I really strongly believe that there needs to be a commitment, an active commitment by governments to address gender equality. And if we don't do that, we will remain in the situation that we're in. And how do we do that? Again, some of it was touched on by Dr. Buta, but it's active commitment to 
education for children, active commitment to primary access to primary health care, active commitment. There's so many, there are millions and millions of young girls out of school who've never had access, exacerbated by COVID. Um, how do we do that? Meaningful sexual reproductive health rights, meaningful um, economic and financial agency, all centered around um, gender equality. So I think that's the short answer of what governments can start doing, how they can start turning off the tap. Thank you. I see a lot of head nods in this crowd, so uh, I think that resonated deeply. Fawad, you recently published a paper in the British Medical Journal with Dr. Buta and others, focused on the importance of strong regional partnerships and institutions in the equation of responding to crises. Could you speak more about the role of community level and local level actors and how they can fit into these regional narrative? Sure, thank you. Um, let me begin with giving a quick brief on what the paper was about, and then I'll, uh, I'll um, take one step back and talk uh, more uh, at a global scale. Um, as, I, as you said, uh, Dr. Buta actually led organizing this, uh, the putting together this team, and the team was comprised of um, researchers, former ministers, um, and uh, technical experts from um, almost all countries in South Asia and, and Afghanistan, somewhere between South and Central Asia. And um, the idea was to focus on the studying the relationship between um, conflict, resilience, um, insurgencies, and peace in that region, in South Asia, and how COVID um, could be uh, a bridge and a linkage between um, uh, the health sector and all the other issues that was discussed and, and, and a linkage to peace and approachment in, in that region. So in the paper, we um, looked into um, the existing literature that existed in, around the, these topics. Um, we also did some analysis of the um, health and education expenditures and did some comparison with a defense and military expenditure in that region. Which is, which is quite, quite different, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, and we also looked into the role of regional uh, cooperation organizations and how uh, they are, are faring in, in, in the current situation in the region. Uh, of course, the analysis wasn't too surprising, and what we, what we analyzed was um, that the um, role of organizations, the regional cooperation organizations such as SARC, which is quite an active organization in the, that region, has been historically ineffective. And as a result of that, uh, many of the member organization, member countries um, had to branch out and um, build alliances and partnerships elsewhere in the region or globally for achieving their um, social um, um, uh, objectives and, and goals. Uh, we also, uh, our analysis of, of comparison between defense and uh, uh, expenditure and health and education also showed that some countries have, uh, actually most countries in that, in that region, South Asia, uh, have two to ten times more uh, military expenditure as compared to health. For example, Pakistan has ten times military expenditure as compared to the health sector. India has five times. And all other countries are not too behind in that, in that list. So that's the reality of what, uh, what we, have, uh, we have noticed. Um, so we made four specific recommendations in that um, analysis paper. <clears throat> the first was um, related to the point that you made in the, uh, earlier, that um, to basically empower and invest more in the leadership of women in that region. And in the paper, we also named specific examples uh, in some of the countries in the region, but also regionally, the um, women champions who actually started changing the, um, the health sector uh, and, and other sectors. The second was um, um, reinvigoration of um, regional cooperation organizations such as SARC or, or similar to that, so they can play a key role in, bringing, in bridging these, these gaps. And the third uh, was around um, uh, having or creating an independent commission to study uh, the relationship between these, these factors that, that we, we talked about. And uh, I have to cheat here. <laughs> the fourth one was around um, promoting people-to-people -people connection, which was, which was really an important um, point that we highlighted. 
because we found out that, and we know for those of us who are from that region, we know that people-to-people uh, -people relationship already exists in culture, sports, and even in the health sector, there are existing relationships in that region. So these were the kind of the, uh, in the paper. If we take a step back at the, at the and look at the global level, uh, and Dr. Buta already alluded to this, but um, just from a humanitarian point of view, about 300 million people um, are in need of humanitarian health, uh, humanitarian help or assistance in this uh, in 2023. About 500 million plus other people are in the borderline of needing help, depending on situation. The recent example of Sudan, for example, I'm pretty sure that that will add to this number. Continuation of situation in Afghanistan and in Ukraine will continue to add to these numbers. 75% of these people uh, live in protracted conflict. Dr. Buto talked about that in a, in a different terminology, complex, long-term, uh, complex uh, crisis. So um, about 75% of these people live in those kind of contexts. Um, we also know that one third of these people are, uh, who are in need live in the context that are affected by climate related, related um, situations. So this is on the need side. When you see on the uh, support available to respond to this, in 2021, only about 53 or 54% of the global need for humanitarian assistance was, need, was responded to. So that's in, in dollar value, that's about 31 plus billion dollars. And you asked about local organizations and localization. Um, sadly, only 1.2% of this, this funding was channeled through local organizations and went to the local organizations. That's the reality of, of the response that, uh, situation that we are dealing with. And so what can we do? The response to this will have to be two-pronged. On one hand, we have to do things to reduce the need through addressing the uh, underlying factors. And Dr. Buta clearly explained some of those in the last uh, few slides where he talked about the relationship between four Cs. On the other hand, we have to find ways to become more effective and efficient in our response. Uh, so a while we know that we, the likelihood of dollar amount to be increased is quite low. So we can at least make our responses more efficient. And the last point, just to, uh, I know that I'm taking more time. At Grand Challenges Canada, we address, on, address both of these through uh, specific investment in bold, innovative ideas that have big impact in the, in the conflict settings. And in my program, uh, Humanitarian Grand Challenge, we specifically focus in conflict settings and, the pop and, uh, and work with populations that have been affected by conflict. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. Thank you, Fouad. We will get to talk a bit more about innovation in a moment. Um, back to you, Dr. Padua. Uh, there are a number of conversations ongoing about how health systems need to be strengthened with climate resilience in mind. What is the research telling us in terms of how this can be done? Before I answer that question, I want to thank you for your comments. I mean, I, every meeting one comes to, one learns something new, and I think something you said really resonates with me which is that how some of the impact of these crises, these shock waves, actually go through existing fault lines. And those fault lines are also very apparent within health systems. So health systems which are, number one, unequal fundamentally in terms of their access and opportunities for the most vulnerable, are impacted by some of the effects of these crises far more than others. Secondly, health systems that don't have the resilience in terms of withstanding some of the challenges of various crises, notably <clears throat> economic crises, don't have either the ability to withstand insults and challenges of the kind like stockouts and, and human resource um, uh, gaps. In relation to the four complex crises, the one new thing that has emerged and is emerging is how can we bring, how can we build climate resilient and also effective health systems which can serve the needs of the population through new strategies and new innovations. And today in, in a different conversation we discussed some of the infrastructure that needs to be modified to address the reality of working with extreme heat, with uh, limited water supplies, 
with also the fact that you will have to have a different way of doing business with environmental temperatures exceeding 40, 50 degrees centigrade, that asking for people to travel long distances to come for standard care where travel is going to be a big challenge, health systems will need to adapt. So I think so far a lot of the discussion, Kirsten, has been on sort of structural modifications needed to make health facilities in many countries carbon neutral. And that is fine. That can happen. But carbon neutrality also has to deal with the fact that we are dealing with many of these facilities without access to clean water, without access to energy. I was at a meeting recently where people were talking about air conditioning in health facilities. In most of our districts, that's an impossibility. And particularly in conflict and fragile settings, having air conditioning in your health facilities is, is just impossible. So we have to look at solutions that can build climate-friendly health systems using some of the common sense technologies and lessons that people have over the years, and to do it with less. So I think the big challenge that many of us face is, can we adapt our existing guidelines? Can we adapt the best practice that we have to develop strategies that are more women-friendly? We talked about greater rollout of group antenatal care, scheduling some of the lessons from COVID in terms of not requiring people to come back eight, eight times you know, for antenatal care. There is no gospel truth out there to say they can't come for a lesser frequency if you had better quality visits. And importantly, the lessons from outreach services. The whole point of developing community health workers and outreach services is that you can take services closer to where they are needed. And particularly with the challenges of conflict fragility and climate, we need to be looking a lot more at how to make user-friendly services, how to make things possible for people to, to get closer uh, access to care to where they are. Thank you. Uh, Chuck Singa, a lot has been said today about the inordinate impact on women in the context of global health and the four Cs, but what are the role of women in leadership in these complex environments that we've been speaking about. Could you speak to us a bit that? Yes, thank you, Kirsten. So I thought long and hard about this question, even if the answer seems really obvious. Um, and I think part of why I thought long and hard about it was how do we answer it in a way that doesn't sound hollow? Because we do talk a lot about, you know, the role of women and leadership and all of that. And I thought, what, what else can we say? You know, um, bring women to the decision-making table, et cetera. And then I was reminded of these words that I read somewhere that said something about, um, at the end of the day, you can focus, you can choose to focus less on that which tears us apart and focus more on that which keeps us together, something like that. And I thought, okay, maybe that's what it is, because I think what keeps us together is our shared humanity, right? What keeps us together is our shared humanity. We understand the place of women in society. We know that women hold families together, hold communities together, and nation builders are breadwinners at the center of it all, even if women don't you know, have the formal titles generally to show that. So maybe the way to approach this is to tap into our shared humanity and know that we can't go anywhere without women holding meaningful positions of leadership. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I just don't know how else we can go deep into that without saying what we've said already, but... <coughs> If I can go a little rogue on you. Go rogue. <laughs> Be a female leader. Go rogue. <laughs> and I mean, I'm, I'm veering a little bit away from, from this question, but also connecting everything I've heard here so far. And I know we're not done talking, but you know, I think, <coughs> bless you. I think what we're hearing is intersectionality, right? We talk about that all the time. Um, and I know that the work that we do at AMREF, so obviously we're a health organization, the largest health organization on the continent. We focus a lot on um, building resilient health systems, including um, human resources for health and all of that. But nothing we do, particularly now, you saw the heat map or the thermal map um, that we saw in Dr. Buta's presentation, 
can happen if we just stick to health as we understand it, right? An almost clinical approach to health. We have to, intersectionality is everything in this. So um, we saw on that map how Africa is and will continue, and other parts, right? That, that middle belt will continue to be um, affected disproportionately by climate change. And sadly, of course, many of these countries, certainly on the African continent, are very negligible contributors to the climate crisis as it is now, but will suffer the greatest effects, right? So I think that um, an intersectional approach is the only way to move forward. You're talking about health, you can't leave health off the agenda. It's been off the agenda of many of the climate big summits that happen around the world. They'll talk about agriculture, transport, energy, but you can't do any of this without health. So intersectionality around all the issues, I think is the only way to make headway and what, what keeps us together and, and how much we need each other. That shared humanity is the only way to move it forward. Thank so you I've, very I've, much. I've, I've touched on like a million things in one quick answer. That's true intersectionality. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for what you did tease us a little earlier about innovation and now's the chance uh, Can you share some some specific examples with us of innovative ways to address response recovery and resilience in these complex environments? Uh, from the perspective of healthcare systems and as Chuck Singa mentioned beyond Sure, um, well, there are two two ways to to look into this um, one is <clears throat> through um, giving you some examples through specific innovations and how they individually and, and um, collectively and incrementally lead to, um, to some changes in the, in the health and, uh, and other sectors, other related sectors. But also um, the, um, what we call system innovation, um, those that have individually or collectively the impact to really significantly change the, the health system, or in, for that matter, the humanitarian system as a, as a whole. Um, at Gr Grand Challenges Canada, um, since its establishment in like, 12 years ago, uh, we have funded over 1,500 innovations. Um, and um, in the humanitarian innovation program, particularly, um, because we are a younger program, five years, uh, we only funded um, 70, about 73 innovations. About 63% of these innovations are in um, implemented or led and owned and implemented by local organizations. So just to link with the localization uh, conversation that, that we had earlier. Um, just to give you a few examples, which relates to the conversation today. Um, so we do fund um, um, innovations in health, wash, um, life-saving information and energy, particularly alternative energy to, uh, in the health sector and other, other sectors as well. Um, an example from the health sector would be, <clears throat> it's a really, um, if I can borrow my, my teenage girl's um, terminology, a cool innovation. It's called Sergibox. So we know that in conflict settings, particularly, um, one of the challenges that when trauma, I mean, there's lots of trauma, and sometimes the nearest trauma management unit or the, ne the nearest operating theater is miles and kilometers away. So this, is, this innovation was created by a group of uh, US and Uganda-based innovators. And they, they basically developed a field-based, portable, small, um, um, mini operation theater. So rather than putting patient in the operation theater, they actually bring the operation theater to specific uh, to the wound area. And so it's connected to basically a f um, a, I'm just trying to find the right, uh, the right way to put it. Um, uh, and fl well, it's a, it's a bubble, a plastic bubble that is connected to a machine and then inflates. Uh, and it's st kind of, it's, it, it's a, it has adhesive things around it and it puts on the, on the trauma. So it gives uh, a sterile environment for the surgeon and for medical personnel in the conflict setting to do the operation or at least the stabilization operation in the field. So it was tested in, in Uganda. We funded it at the seed level, which was the kind of pilot phase. And um, it, they developed the proof of concept 
And over the past three years, they've started expanding it in other contexts, and it has been expanded to Mali, Burkina Faso, and with the Ukraine conflict over the past year almost, they have started um, testing it in, in that context, and we are in conversation with them to expand it to, to other contexts as well. So that's just a, an, an example. Uh, the other example related to the COVID, uh, when COVID hit, um, one of the challenges we have experienced in the sector in, in almost all countries, including Syria, particularly the, the northeastern part of Syria, was that personal protective equipment was really in shortage. And the septic supply chain had a big impact on it. And that part of Syria was particularly affected because of the political issues uh, within the country. So we work with a local innovator there, White Helmets, who are actually also a Canada-based organization. But they have a local team on the ground. So what they did, we worked with them uh, to turn a carbon factory into a PPE uh, production factory. And they have continued working there, and they have produced millions of masks and gowns and hats and all, uh, initially for medical personnel. Uh, and then later on for general public, and that to date continues. And there's actually a team at uh, University of Toronto, the REACH Alliance, they've done a case study on it. Uh, and uh, there are a couple of factors that, that were outlined. So that's on the in specific uh, innovation uh, examples. And the more at the kind of systemic uh, innovation level, I can give an example from the energy sector. Um, we work with an innovator, um, they initially started in, in DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, so what they did was they took the, uh, what, uh, something that had already existed, uh, which was called um, renewable energy credit. So it's basically a um, um, carbon credit that had already existed in the market. And they layered peace credit on top of that. So they call it PREC, so peace renewable energy credit. So the, the essence of this, this um, innovation is to bridge the missing link between local small-scale energy producers um, uh, and create a new revenue path for them by selling their PREX to big companies such as Microsoft and Google. And so, as we funded them at the, at the seed level, so they tested the idea, and they started expanding to other humanitarian organizations. They entered into an agreement with IOM. IOM used the, used the, the um, innovation in one of their um, IDP camps in DRC. And now where we stand, we, f we are funding them at the transition to scale. So, um, I was in, in Geneva last week, and they presented the, their innovation. There are at least 15 global humanitarian organization who are in lineup to work with them. Because what they offer is a solution for almost everyone in the, in the ecosystem. <clears throat> they work with, with energy producers to link them to the global market. They work with global market, in this case big corporations, who actually buy these kind of carbon credits to bring them double credits, peace and climate and work with humanitarian organization where they can bring like-minded organizations, like for example, other innovators we work with who produce energy to provide them solution. UNICEF is one of those organizations uh, that are interested because they have huge energy need, IOM and MSFs and others. They are, they're all the organizations that work with. So I hope these are a few examples that could uh, answer your question. Thank you for that. Uh, Chuck Singa, before we move to Dr. Buddha in the final formal question and we go to the audience, I wondered, uh, as you reflect on what you've heard today uh, and, we saw, and you referenced the heat map, do you think there are local lessons and have there been sort of opportunities of learning from this complexity of crisis that AMREF has seen that we, you might want to explore further as we head into new solutions in these environments? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I think um, certainly, I mean, AMREF, you know, we have a footprint in 35 different countries, large and small, but diff uh, different countries across the continent, um, and are right at the heart of what's, for example, the food crisis, the drought, the famine in the Horn of Africa, which has been going on for a long time. Um, we were, we were right in and remain in Malawi following Cyclone Freddy and the ongoing aftermath. And it's exactly 
what Dr. Buta touched on, it's not just now the, you know, a thousand people who will die in the first week. This, the fallout goes on for a very long time. So we're seeing it. And I think um, there is an understanding that we can't just remain a health organization in the classic sense of the word. Of course, that's what we exist to do, but in that way. Um, and AMRAF is understanding that our role is to thoughtfully bring the pieces that matter together that allow us to be a true health responder, health provider in a way that matters. I think that the, the, really the number, and so the number one and two crises, it's so hard to rate them sometimes, all the Cs, but it's certainly the fallout from COVID, certainly conflict, we can see what's happening in Sudan at the moment um, and other parts and climate, right? And so we're absolutely seeing that we are building it into the way we're doing our work and moving forward advocacy, so whether pushing, you know, the COP venues to, main, to mainstream health as part of those conversations. Um, and, and, you know, I think the advocacy that we did through COVID and, and, and vaccine inequity and vaccine apartheid, there were so many names for it, to bring vaccines to the continent. Um, so it's absolutely at the center of what we do and what we see, and we, we work hard to continue to evolve and respond. Um, knowing that there's so much cleanup to be done, the, you know, just seeing what has happened in Malawi to the health systems, all the gains made over the years lost in one fell swoop from one cyclone um, and the fallout from that. And so, yeah, absolutely an important part of what we do and how we are reframing and understanding our role as the largest health NGO on the continent and what does that really mean? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, our, for, our final formal question for you, Zofie Uh This September, the UN will convene a midpoint summit on the Sustainable Development Goals, halfway between the 2015 launch and the 2030 deadline. The conversation should focus on what needs to be done differently. In the current environment of complexity and uncertainty, what is the research telling us about the needs of countries to be able to prepare for unforeseen crises? And in your opinion, what needs to be done differently for strengthened health systems and beyond? So first, our work on health and health-related sustainable development goals shows very clearly that there needs to be some organizational reform in terms of what's happening at country level, particularly around health and health-related SDGs. Um, much of the work on the health-related SDGs is generally within the ambit of uh, either the ministries of health, and if we are fortunate in a few places around ministries of women's development and social protection. And it's very clear that if you're going to bring climate change and if you're going to bring some of the newer learnings of complex crisis to the table, then there has to be a slightly different arrangement of where SDGs sit. At the moment, in many places, SDGs sit either in planning commissions, very centrally, or in the offices of the heads of state. In some places, the president or the prime minister holds it. But increasingly, we're discovering that those are largely just data or statistics units, whose task is to collate information and prepare a very good report at the end of two years or three years for feedback to the UN Secretariat. What we want to see change is a multi-stakeholder initiative in countries which is beyond the public sector, also includes civic societies, and actually is an embodiment and implementation of some of the think tanks that were set up in the preparatory process of moving from the MDGs to the SDGs. But sadly, very few of those think tanks have been engaged in the operationalization and the oversight and implementation of health and health-related SDGs. So some of our work currently is focused on what is the triangle that will move the mountain. What is it that will change in terms of planning processes? And I'm now more and more convinced that some of these initiatives will come out of civic society initiatives. Empowering communities, think tanks, <coughs> particularly young people. Because remember, a lot of the global development and climate agenda is, is really resonating with people whose future is affected by this. So I don't think we should be looking at business as usual through technocrats, bureaucrats, and even some of the traditional academics. We should be looking at a new way of configuring and bringing people on board. So just as a last point on where the innovations in some of this, 
As part of our health and health related sustainable development goals implementation review work, uh, we are looking at the potential of creating town halls. And town halls are relatively unknown in low and middle income countries. They're a standard way of engaging and communicating and bringing some degree of accountability to uh, uh, office bearers, but they are virtually unheard of in many of the traditional LMIC settings. But I think there is a way forward of these town halls, particularly young people participating, women participating, to create a dialogue around what needs to be done, what needs to be done with a level of granularity on implementation, which is not, not just the federal capitals or, or big cities, but is increasingly the district health systems and districts. So uh, some of this is going to be a learning process, but I've been in the business of global health long enough to know that some of these ideas can also take on a momentum of their own. And if you truly want a transformative approach to sustainable development, then you've got to put people in the middle of that, not on the margins. Very well said. That's a great segue to put these people in the middle of our dialogue. Uh, I know there's many inquisitive and uh, passionate people with us today, both in person and online. Does anyone in the room have a question? If you do, please just use the microphone so we can make sure that our online participants can hear you. Thank you very much. This was an incredible discussion. I, my country of origin is Afghanistan, and I have witnessed these circumstances firsthand. Uh, you named the four C's. I believe there are four more, or, or maybe more than four. Like you named corruption, there is culture, communicable disease, crime rate. They are all interrelated and collaboration between different actors. My question is about the um, efficient use of funding and resources. There is funding, but I believe that um, there, 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 there is need for reforming the utilization of funding. What do you think about the impact of efficient use of funding on improving the maternal and child health? Thank you. Is that a question to me? So, um, what's your name, if I may ask? Sabar. 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 So, I think some of the best examples of countries building themselves up from crises have been when there hasn't been an overflow of funds. If you look at the global development history, uh, some of the most remarkable examples are when people have had relatively frugal resources, but good local leadership and sound policies that have helped them build themselves up from within. The Rwandas of this world weren't rebuilt on global development assistance only. Development assistance matters, but also what matters is governance, oversight, and also accountability. So those three things are critical. If you, uh, and I've had very interesting discussions because I do a lot of my work in Afghanistan, on what is their relationship in terms of impact and development assistance, models of care that could have been done with a lot better, uh, let's say, cost-effectiveness analyses. So to answer your question, how can we do better in terms of global development assistance and utilization of resources? The simple answer to that is by greater oversight, accountability, and governance at the local level. And that's one of the reasons why in our work and in some of the examples that we want to set forward, we want to devolve a lot of this decision making and process to local levels of government. Because in my experience, and I come from a maternal child health uh, uh, background, true accountability is at the level when the decision makers and resources are closer to where the recipients are. And if there are those processes in place, the chances of those resources being utilized are much greater. We come from the same culture where local accountability through either power structures or the social cultural matrix that we have out there 
is much easier to sort out at the local level than it is in the capital, or even the capital's capital. So um, that's, that's a, a way of saying how um, does reform take place. But there are remarkable examples from Latin America and remarkable examples from successful stories of countries that have built themselves up from, from potential adverse circumstances where this has been achieved. So for every negative example, there are positive examples of how countries have rebuilt themselves also, sometimes subnational examples of how in a given situation, one province has done better than another. And you are quite aware of how that has been the case also in our region. Well, thank you, Dr. Buddha. I think you covered it nicely. I just wanted to add one more point. Um, <clears throat> I think in addition to leadership, uh, accountability and reform and, and, and sound policies, prioritization is another, another area related to these, these three points. Because even in the most advanced and um, like even G7 countries, um, there is always shortage of resources. In Canada, we, we have years, sometimes a year or 18 months of waiting to get a specialist services. But it's about that prioritization because the system, uh, the policymakers and the the, the accountability system has prioritized resources in a way and put it in a place where the immediate needs are, are met, and that's emergency services, primary care, and all. Um, and that's a key factor. Another example uh, uh, could be in in the like two decades ago was was Cuba that went through the crisis and then kind of built its system. And Vietnam is another example. Uh, in addition to to Rwanda, these are like really the recent examples we we have in mind. Thank you. Do you have another question? There's yeah, there's someone behind you with the microphone. Go ahead. Hi, thank you for this amazing conversation. My name is Joanna Cagayo. I'm a recent master's graduate in sustainable development and currently work in climate. I had a question for Mr. Fawad. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name right, well. Yeah. Um, you gave an example of um, Congo in relation to the carbon credit, and um, you mentioned it being a solution. Could you please elaborate on that? Because um, I believe Congo has been, uh, how can I explain? Uh, the international committee hasn't really done what they are supposed to do, therefore um, I really would like to hear why you think uh, that w that is a solution? <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Um, just to to well, I, I'll, I'll give a longer response, but just to begin, I didn't say that it solved all the problems. I said this specific innovation ha has the potential to have a bigger impact. Um, so this innovation is only three years old. Um, um, so how this is a solution? It's a solution to a particular problem. It doesn't uh, it doesn't solve the entire health system challenge or the entire humanitarian system challenge. But in the energy sector, one of the challenges is availability of, of alternative energy. Because, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with that part of the world and in many low and middle income countries. Uh, on great um, public, publicly provided energy is very scarce and it doesn't reach to the farthest parts of the, of the country, particularly those parts that are affected by, by conflict. So this model promotes the local um, investors, private sector particularly, to, and encourage them to invest in the area that are, that are off-grade. So, um, and how do, do they do that? They, by offering a new um, financing mechanism. So how does that work? Is that if I'm an energy producer in a remote area in DRC, or now, now they're expanding to Nigeria and Ethiopia and other places as well, is that in normal circumstances, I would have only one revenue uh, when, I, when I do, like, let's say, a million dollar investment, and that is by subscription. So individual households consume energy, and then they, they pay me, and that's how I run the business. That will continue. So this new innovation offers them an, an additional revenue source, and that is to take the carbon credits and the piece credit of their energy, and then at the aggregate level, sell it to the um, the global demand market uh, that, that, that 
um, buys these kind of so airlines and big corporations like Microsoft, Google, and these these uh, companies. So it, it solves a particular problem from uh, energy production and supply uh, and demand um, um, uh, side of things. From a health and humanitarian side, a, so they also use the produced energy to light, for example, streets. So one of the energy producers that work with them in um, Nigeria is called Prado Power. What they did, so they they sell their energy to the households in the in the community, but also provided free light uh, uh, or free power for lighting of streets in the local market in several cities. And so we did a study of that, and the study shows that the um, um, business um, viability and the turnover of the of the business in the local market has increased by about 25 to 27 percent and the time of of business continued to go beyond the dark time because usually because of the and there's also a gender aspect to it because women weren't there to continue doing their business or stay in the market for for uh, during the dark but then this this is the the other aspect of it the humanitarian humanitarian and gender side of it and i give example of iom being their client so they have there is an IDP camp. So in normal circumstances, they would use uh, diesel generated um, power to supply energy to the camp. But now they're using the uh, the uh, solar power, and because the solar power also produces revenue, it can, it's, it's really a positive cycle that will continue. So it solves a particular problem, not the entire problem of the of the health or humanitarian system. Thank you. I understand. Oh much better now but I think in the case of Congo we really have to be um, we have to choose the words that we that we use when speaking about Congo um, because uh, when saying that this is a solution and that uh, Microsoft and these big com companies are gonna come save Congo it gives a bit of a saviorism complex and also um, as as myself listening here, I'm thinking, okay, what about the exploitation? Are they, what are they getting in return? So, yeah, thank you. Now I understand better. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Buddha, did you want to push forward a little further on that? <laughs> we have a meeting next week. So we'll <laughs> <laughs> I just put poison in his tea. Yeah. I, I think suffice it to say that, like every idea out there, including, you know, things that had to do with airline taxation to help support um, vaccinations and financing. All good ideas on the table are great ideas, but they have to stand the test of time. And I think the point that is being underscored is the carbon credits as such, which are in the eyes of some people a, a, an insufficient strategy to persuade people to reduce emissions. Um, uh, and principally legitimizing to some extent the continued carbon footprint that many organizations have just under the guise of some kind of a corporate social responsibility and therefore giving resources back under the guise of this carbon credit. They need to be evaluated both in terms of the pros and cons of this overall with counterfactuals. What if you did not give them that cop out? What if you absolutely insisted that everybody signed up to the Paris Accord of trying to reduce emissions by a certain extent, by a point in time, uh, and, uh, and then see which worked better. So um, uh, I think at this stage the jury's out, and it's only a few years, and we should measure this again against you know, actual global sustained reductions that can come from the very people who are organizations that are putting carbon out there. Thank you. Another question from the audience? This gentleman here. Hi, my name is Azim Motiani. The point that Fawad talked about increasing defense budgets, which I think are more like offense budgets, is a sad and disappointing reality of our time. It used to be that arms were sold to stop wars. Now wars are started to sell arms. With regard to mitigation of conflict, do you think the UN could reduce the threat and length of conflict by calling out countries and companies supplying money and arms to conflicting parties, especially in Africa and the Middle East? 
Who would like to comment on what the UN may or may not do? I can have a go at this because, I mean, this is an area where I have written extensively and, and done work in the past, not as a pacifist, but as a realist. I mean, I think the ground reality is that uh, we have major superpowers uh, who are beholden to their constituents in terms of selling arms. Not a single U.S. president or a political party can ever take an initiative to say, we are going to reduce the sale of arms and the sale of weaponry to low and middle income countries and the Middle East, mm -hmm. they would be out of business before long because all of these mm -hmm. lobbies and, uh, uh, and, and groups out there thrive on a, as you said, defense industry, but a defense industry that is dependent upon exports. Now, the downside is that unfortunately, the world is also a complex place. And uh, uh, the ground reality is that, if anything, since we started our work on the branch consortium, the magnitude of global conflict has actually increased, and increased exponentially. If you look at the amount of money that has been spent on just Ukraine alone in the last year, year and a bit, it overshadows anything that had been done before. It vastly overshadows even the money that was spent on the so-called forever wars of Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, just in terms of the magnitude. And it has the potential of being even a multiplier in terms of how weaponry technology and, uh, unfortunately, even the possibility that you would have uh, air systems, uh, weaponry, put into place. And now we've got Sudan, and very few people recognize that although it may seem like an internal conflict, it basically is a proxy war. And so we have to once again go back to the days of the 60s and 70s where the world really was being pushed towards a more peaceful arrangement by who? By the young people. And although the dominant, let's say, motive at that time for people wanting peace and, and global stability may have been the draft in the US, but the reality is people are sick and tired of conflict. Ask our friends from Afghanistan. Their lives have been uprooted. I did my first, first job as a young physician. I come from Peshawar. My first job in 1977 was in a refugee camp as a young pediatrician. Gosh, that's a lifetime ago. If you had asked me at that time, would we continue to see conflict? I would have said, are you crazy? We just can't see children being maimed and killed like they are. And yet we are sitting in 2023 and the world is not a safer or a better place, not even in the geography we're talking about. So we need a global movement of some sorts which looks at conflict reduction. Not just remediation, but we need actually to address the root causes of conflict. And many of the forces that I talked about, friends, are also causes of conflict. One of our biggest worries in global development are how climate change and conflict intersect. And in, in some of the regions of the world, the next wars are not going to be over land. They're going to be over water. And, and the genesis of many of even the recent and current conflicts are also over water. We are worried about Sudan today. But the bigger worry is not Sudan, is what, what if Sudan gets out of the way and there is a war between, fight between Egypt and Ethiopia on water resources? So, uh, sorry to sound a somber note, but the reality is that we do need to find something which is more than just wishful thinking. And I hanker back to the days where as a young person myself, there was a world which may have sounded utopian where people really truly wanted peace. And just to finish, there is a body of work that's coming out very soon against IDRC supported, which looks at the relationship of gender equality and peace. This is our Lancet Site Commission report will come out in a couple of months. And I think some of those investments in the social determinants of health, those that can plug some of the fault lines that you talked about, are potentially maybe one way of looking at a more peaceful society. I'm convinced myself that the more we empower women, 
the less likely we are to see conflicts and have sustained conflicts. I mean, that's been the global experience in many places. If you look at Africa, the best remediation, the best mediation, best strategy have been with female leaders, women leaders. We need more of them, not less. Nothing else to add. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> covered it nicely. <laughs> Do we we need more women leaders. I think that's been driven home. Any other questions from the audience or our colleagues online? Uju? Yes, so um, I'll just read some of the questions that have coming online. Um, so we have three here. The first one, and I'm guessing I can address this to any of the speakers who has knowledge or information to share on this. Um, so specifically, uh, what opportunities exist for healthcare students or trainees to get involved, you know, in the myriad of, you know, the conversations we're having, the context, is there any way um, or any resources that people who are interested in doing more um, can get connected to? Yeah, okay. Um, I think that a lot of you know students who are in the space that you're talking about, Uju, and who are so excited to get involved, sometimes think that means they have to jump on a plane and go to Afghanistan or Ethiopia or wherever and get their hands in. But I think there's a lot of work that can also be done here. I think one area that needs student or recent graduate minds is more research around around conflict, uh, uh, rather uh, climate, the climate crisis, and health. Um, there is an understanding, but there's no large body of research that can really inform decisions. So I will tell students that do that research. I think that's a great place to start. Just to build on that, <clears throat> last week I was in Geneva and there was, we had a whole range of conversation around a similar topic. One of the things that came out was that there's a clear disconnect between what, we, what is globally called the humanitarian sector and the health sector, or in general, the development sector. So there's that disconnect, including in research. So one thing that the, these young students could do is to bridge that gap, where <clears throat> those with, I mean, we just talked about the interconnectivity of health with other, other sectors, and that's exactly where, where the gap is. And that gap could be filled by, uh, by knowledge that could be generated by, by these students. One thing more selfishly I could say uh, is that if um, they have some new ideas, uh, no matter how small, um, they could apply for next round of funding for, uh, to Grand Challenges Canada, because that's exactly what our seed funding is, to give them a high risk tolerance funding to test their new ideas. Some of them, or vast majority of them, may, may fail, but at least a few of them would succeed. Would, that would have a bigger impact. If we're doing shameless plugs, we could also add that they might want to consider a career in the development sector and apply for one of the international youth fellowships offered by Aga Khan Foundation Canada and take their skill set and their passion for health uh, and see where that leads them. You can check that out online. Um, thank you for all of this information. Um, the next question that I have here says, um, corruption was mentioned at the beginning as the fifth C. What can be done to reduce the effect of corruption on the outcomes to improve health in the most affected countries? We, we need another seminar. Uh, well, I mean, corruption is also the ground reality of many uh, uh, settings such as this, particularly where you have fragile health systems, lack of governance, uh, and there is no easy answer to this. So elimination of corruption requires actions at all levels. Generally, when we are talking about corruption, we are talking about corruption that leads to the drain of external assistance, and leakage of resources that are available, and there, the onus of responsibility in terms of ensuring that there are transparent processes, oversight, uh, and some accountability also fall, uh, falls on the donor agencies themselves. And in many instances, also on the private sector that is engaged. I'm talking about the international private sector. 
that is engaged in many activities in those countries and turn a blind eye very happily if their work gets done and is generally done much more efficiently than democracies than in autocracies or in the hands of dictators. So those are the ground realities of how corruption flourishes in many of those circumstances and therefore I would say the burden of responsibility falls on the governments whose dollars are flowing in that, in, in that direction. Then it also falls on civic society and civic society is not just civic society within the countries, it's also our, our, our journalists and our media, particularly the investigative journalism, I mean, you know, which can find those um, sources as well as the depth of uh, some of those practices. And oftentimes they are not welcome in, in those countries, but they, they still manage to get the message across. And lastly, as I, as I said, there is a very close relationship between civic society engagement, gender equality, and remediation of some of these efforts and actions. And without getting into a lot of debate, I think it unfortunately is closely dependent upon how autocratic a particular you know, rule is. But in general, you will find that there is no close correlation, unfortunately, between um, democratic processes and corruption levels and their uh, remediation in many places, sadly because of many agencies that turn a blind eye to it. Thank you. And um, the last question I'll read for now. Um, it says, we now understand that resources are going to be scarce with climate change and more conflicts. What are your suggestions to make a more resilient health system? Do we need to go back to the community health volunteers and primary health care? Well, I could, I could share my two cents. Um, yes, to that, of course, I mean, there's no need for going back. I think there has been quite a lot of um, interest and in, in growth and involvement evolution of, of investments in the community health workers. Um, um, what some would argue that perhaps um, community health workers are in certain locations are overburdened because there are too many things are being done through them or uh, a force on them. But there are other ways to, to look at this. Um, I mean, we, we talked about the, the Dr. Buta talked about leadership accountability and having sound policies. I mentioned the prioritization. The, those are other measures to, to have in place. Um, and we also mentioned earlier the um, linkage between the health sector and other sectors. That's, a, that's, a, 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 that's another way of um, um, leveraging resources in other sectors for health benefits and in the health sector for the benefit of other other sectors. These are a few other other uh, areas that I could um, I could add. Um, yeah, I can add uh, my two cents as well to that. I think, yeah, I think always bringing health close to communities, not just to patients, but through community health workers, is important. Um, certainly, the gap that they're filling is not just because of um, lack of resources, but also brain drain. So many trained medical um, people leaving or being drawn out of Africa to um, maybe greener pastures. Um, and so there's a big gap for them to fill. Um, and yeah, deepen the work of community health and, and reaching that final mile, so to speak. Um, and I think, yeah, involving communities in their own health will always be the way forward. It's not it's not so much going back, I think, like you said, it's, it's, go, it's the way to go forward um, to make health systems more resilient. And I think it also touches a little bit on what Dr. Buta referred to earlier. Sometimes the best ideas and innovations come from a scarcity place. So it, it allows for ideas to grow and, um, yeah, but community health models, I, I think we're trying to do that as well here in Ontario and across Canada. Um, and it, it, it just covers so much more mileage than top-down models ever could. And I think, you know, a good example 
if you look across Africa at places that made great headway in response to the HIV was pandemic epidemic is where community-based work and responses were strongest. That's really where a lot of um, turnaround was made. So it's a good model and example for what can happen at the community level. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one final question from the room, if there is one. Hi there, I'm Heather McBride. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director of the Nutrition Program over at Global Affairs Canada. Really pleased to be here today. Um, I, in fact, have four questions, but that's okay. Maybe <laughs> if there's some mingling time afterwards, then I can, I can approach everybody. So I will choose my top one um, based on my nutrition hat. Uh, on the, the cost of living, um, it is, we didn't really get into it perhaps being a knowing that it's a driver towards cheaper and more unhealthy food, um, specifically packaged um, foods, uh, ultra, also known as ultra-processed foods. Um, and that really links to the role of the private sector, uh, but it also contributes to the double burden of malnutrition and the heavy impacts, of course, on health and our health sector. So I'm just wondering kind of on um, you know, like research and evidence, it's out there, but is there enough? You know, are we are we raising the profile enough, um, and are we perhaps attempting to work with the pri private sector enough on this this issue? Thank you. So, I think ideally we should be looking at climate resilient agriculture and food systems. And as, as you're likely aware, I mean, one of the first things to be impacted in any crisis is, is the food environment. And particularly in urban settings, you're absolutely right with poverty. Uh, we, we, we see the impact of unhealthy foods, and they don't have to be, in many circumstances, industry-produced foods. They're also locally produced and market-available unhealthy foods uh, that are just easier to consume and, and uh, less balanced. But the ground reality is that a lot of these things will, in my humble opinion, uh, come from a combination of public-private partnerships. Because I don't think, at least based on my experience, that you can depend entirely upon the industry to be altruistic here. And, uh, and certainly on the, on the hunger elimination and on the food security side, uh, the role of industry has been checkered at best, uh, partly because they are driven by profits, and uh, profits do require at times for them to not give away what their crown jewels are. And their crown jewels are generally unhealthy foods. There is, however, tremendous uh, evidence in the literature, some of it reviewed by my own group in looking at how countries responded to economic crises by improving food and agriculture systems. And, and I can happily send you the evaluation of the stunting exemplars work in Kyrgyzstan. So here is Kyrgyzstan. You know, with reasonably well-developed primary care system, ideal education, a health programs, and all of a sudden was cut loose by the Soviet Union at the time when they became independent. They dumped that country, that Stan, virtually overnight, left them with no agriculture systems because it was basically their cotton producing belt. It had lost over the last 100 years almost any institutional memory of what it was like to have subsistence agriculture or to even simple, simple farming. So if you look at then what happened in Kyrgyzstan in that period between the early 90s and beyond is they had a substantial increase in undernutrition, stunting rates you know, from whatever historical data they were, virtually doubled. And before the penny uh, dropped, that they needed to do something much more basic. And that's where the Kyrgyz government came in. In addition to land reform, there was an agriculture reform in terms of promoting food security. And they did that through diversification, agriculture reform, and, and ensuring that there was the possibility that they could feed their people not processed foods, but staples. 
And as a result, within 10 years, they were able to reduce stunting levels in, in Kyrgyzstan by an average rate of reduction. If you look at the CGR, it's about 3.5 to 4% per annum. And that's why it's an exemplar. And it's one of the most remarkable exemplars of how countries can build themselves up even in the midst of one of the gravest economic crises. But they were able to do that, I think, on the shoulders of enormous investments in some of the social drivers of undernutrition that they already had in place. They had almost universal education. They had immunization rates that were sky high. They had very uh, 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 you know, egalitarian primary care systems. So given all of that, they were able to build themselves up from that financial crisis very rapidly. So did the countries that I talked about, the Asian financial crisis countries, all of those countries that were worst affected, that had 28, 26, 27 percent reduction in GDP over that short period of time, were able to bounce back within five years. So the Indonesias, the Vietnams, that were so significantly impacted by the Asian financial crisis, all had an increase in undernutrition in a short period of time. Within five years, were able to bounce back because the fundamentals were intact. So I think it can be done. So there is hope that despite the economic crisis, if countries take ownership on proper planning, on execution, and on ensuring that they build sustainable food systems and dietary diversification and, and some support to subsistence farming and food security, that they can overcome this crisis also. But I don't think the solution is in the hands of the private sector. Thank you. That was a remarkable example. And I also think it's remarkable that you remember the outcomes of a study from 30 years ago. So. The study is more recent, but the was Thank you to our esteemed panelists for your, your research, your expertise, your perspective, uh, and your commentary on our, on our topic today. Uh, I do want to ask you to regain your seats in the audience. And as we mentioned today, we are doing this event. Thank you. <laughs> we are doing this event in partnership with our colleagues and friends at IDRC. And I would like to invite to the stage to make closing remarks, uh, Kamar Mahmood from IDRC. Thank you, Kamar. Hi everyone, and thank you so much uh, for this. Uh, well, thank you to the panelists uh, because it was a very interesting and engaging panel, and uh, to Kristen for you know moderating this panel, and uh, for Vad and uh, Chiksinga and uh, Dr. Butta, of course. Uh, much to learn and much to uh, engage in this panel. I, I think it was very interesting the way the panel sort of problematized um, complexity in the way they did, but also focusing on solutions, uh, which was, or thinking about them at least, uh, was very, um, I think which you, you could get, uh, see from the questions and uh, Q&A session that you know how engaged everyone was. So thanks for that. Uh, I'd also like to especially thank uh, Dr. Butta because uh, I know you, uh, I'd appreciate that you know you acknowledge IDRC's uh, partnership and support, but really it is uh, your uh, leadership that you know has been kind of pushing us ever since we, I guess, started formally engaging with you since I think 2016 when uh, you have a, you really had us think about uh, in our health programming at IDRC in particular about uh, having conflict as a, of a focus. So it was at that meeting at, uh, you know, in uh, Toronto that, you know, that started this journey that, you know, we've been learning uh, through you and your uh, excellent collaborators globally. Uh, but then you sort of brought, uh, you know, health SDGs focus. And then for, following that, it was the climate change and health uh, and now, so you keep, now it's complexity, so you keep shifting the, you know, the, the bar, the goalpost for us as well, which is, uh, which is really, um, I mean, I think it's, it's, uh, it's very encouraging for us that we have uh, research leadership like this. Um, uh, before I forget, I also wanted to really thank Uju and uh, Sophia for uh, thinking about bringing this panel together, filtering some of those ideas, and also uh, the, 
you know, going through the logistics of, uh, of all of this. I know at AKFC you're really good at that, and you know we always like to be, you know, welcome to this venue because it's it's uh, so it's so amazing, but it's also very humiliating. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, humbling uh, to 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 uh, to to come to this venue. It's a very uh, calming experience, you know, always to come here. Uh, but um, also. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank AKFC because, uh, and AKF in general, or AKDN, I know there are like so many of these, AKU and AKHS, it's always, you know, it takes time to get our head around that, uh, that uh, you've always come forward uh, in partnering, um, you know, uh, with, with us in some of the most challenging uh, uh, topics and also I was uh, talking to Steve earlier that you know some places where we just cannot go uh, because of all the logistics and all the uh, like conflict related areas uh, I, uh, AKFC really comes forward and supports uh, in that way but also not just as a co-funder but uh, at times being on the ground and uh, so we really would like to Thank you for uh, your partnership. And this, I, I, I think this panel was a good example of uh, taking opportunity of Dr. Bhutta's, uh, you know, visit to Ottawa and, uh, you know, bringing this, this panel together. So uh, just to say thanks to, and thanks to the audience, uh, both uh, present here and then online uh, for this um, uh, very engaging conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kamar, and thank you once again to all of our panelists, to our moderator, to everyone who has joined us today. Um, which I would just like to quickly invite everyone to uh, please give us some feedback about today's event. Um, so we do have a QR code that has popped up on the screen. So um, if you don't mind, just you know, bring out your devices. Um, you can scan the QR code. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to get your perspective. Any recommendations, any suggestions, any other types of topics or panelists or conversations that you feel like we can continue having within this space we really love to hear from you and also to everyone joining online um, the link should have popped in your chat as well um, we do welcome you once again to please um, take fill out the form using the link and we thank everyone so much for your time your commitment your dedication towards today's event towards today's conversation and to our special guests who are in the room we do have refreshments that are already available um, so please don't be in a hurry um, also spend some time mingling speaking with um, connecting with our speakers and other colleagues that are in the room thank you once again <laughs>